So the way this works is we have an open mic over there. We start out with these four panelists. We're going to go through one question. And then we're going to open up the floor. And if anyone here has a question, put up your hand. Now, here's the thing. If it's a question, pure question, then we'll have these four panelists answer it. If it's a question, if it's an opinion <laughs> wrapped in a question, then you're actually going to take the seat of one of these people. Um, just be aware. But that's good. It means you then get to answer the questions. And we go from there. So I'm going to start off in a certain direction, but then we can really take this anywhere we want. Cool? Are we ready? Let's get excited. Do something. Yeah. So there was, I had a sort of opening question that was very positive. It was like how DAOs can fix things. Let's talk about how DAOs can fix things. But after that presentation, I have a different question. Uh, what do you, oh, do you guys all have mics? Are you mic'd? Are you right mic'd? Mm -hmm. You oh, have that? You have the other, okay, cool. I think, can this we pass there, right? one over that way? How far does that? We're good. That's fine. Hello. hello. So, and, I, and here's the thing is, I'm the, oh yeah, that's the other rule is I'm the judge. <laughs> Sometimes I try to get your, the kind of the jury's thoughts on it as well. But yeah, so the first question is actually, what do you think about Sonny's idea that he just presented? Do we need a Byzantine battalion? Yeah, I think it's fun. I think being a little bit like benevolently nefarious is kind of like a fun idea and just kind of like makes the whole everything we're building a lot stronger. So I think like Sonny's just saying, yeah, we should try to break things in a benevolent way before attackers try to do it in a malicious way. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, another thing is that when you talk to other protocols, there are many protocols being built, right? And they have a lot of uh, clearly impossible claims. Right, someone will come and say, you know, we're resilient to 80% colluding actors. And you sort of know it is impossible, right? Uh, or, like, you know, or like someone else says, we have a BFT consensus which can tolerate more than 30% of malicious actors. Right? And so, but you cannot really prove them wrong until you actually go and encode it. Right? So if there's a Byzantine battalion who's, who's willing to do that and go ahead and, and break those claims, that would be pretty cool. That would be exciting. And, and it's also very fun to do. Right? It's actually very fun to go get open source code, go and like build and break it. So... I'm definitely signing up. <laughs> I totally agree. I'd say uh, break it on Kusama before Polkadot mainnet, please. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good idea to do this in like a comedic way as well, as well right? You, we can all make a little fun of each other, you know, like this Edgeware thing now. And uh, I think everyone, it, yeah, let's just have fun with this. Do you want to I mean, this is also an argument for... James is a uh, developer fork of Ethereum, right? Like, there needs to be environments for this. You don't want to put the full stake of a network up to attack if you're just testing to see if it'll break. Okay, I have one follow-up question to that. That's awesome, but, like, what motivates people to do this? Like, are they... They're sure, not going to sure. be paid, are they? Like, how do, how do you encourage people to actually do this? I wish you were up here, but... Do you think that that's possible? Do you think that there's a way to actually encourage people to do this? Well, one thing I said, it's fun, right? So if, if there is a little bit of time, like Sunny has time now, <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually a lot of fun to do that. Uh, and second one is fame. If you go and break, uh, you know, and break something, you go brag on Twitter, you get, you know, 500 likes, everybody likes you, every, you get followers, you know, it's uh, awesome. Vanity fame metrics. Fame or yeah. infamy? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to open it up to the floor. If anyone has any comments, questions, any points, any thoughts? I'm going to give it, a, give it a second. Let's see what's going on. Okay, so we have one up here. Do you want to pass him the mic? Yeah, I, I think when uh, it comes about trolling, you basically have two kinds of trolls, okay? One that is just making fun of, out, of, out of the whole thing. They are with no purpose besides just lauding about people. And then you have the purposeful troll, okay? The purposeful troll could be both positive and negative for, let's say, the government of, of, of the community itself. And I think that though in those cases, they actually uh, believe what they say, but mm, even more, they sense what they say, and they just follow their own guts, and they see stuff going wrong 
there and they just want to attack. They want to attack. They okay. want to attack. They That's, want to see people bleeding. I want everyone to take note. That is an opinion. And you can now take a seat on yeah, the stage. Yeah, totally uh, you're off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start a sentence with I think, maybe, you know, not do that. You can, uh, be prepared. You, you yeah. can also ask just a general question. If you have like a, a what if, <laughs> I can hear you, Ryan. You're not even on the mic. <laughs> what is the boundary of benevolence in Byzantine behavior? Is it the case perhaps if Ethereum research into formally verified Ethereum smart contracts happened only because so many were exploited? Was it benevolent to exploit those contracts instead of you know, responsibly reporting the bugs. Oh, there's a little opinion in there. Do you want to get up here? Okay. Well, actually, ans <laughs> answer the question if you have an answer to that. I don't have a good answer. You do? You don't? Okay. Okay, so then you can come up. Do you guys have an answer to that? So I would say it's a little bit about motivation, right? So, of course, even if the outcome is the same, if you go in with the motivation to actually make the system better and make every everything like to point out and flag the the problems within the system then uh, it's benevolent if you just want to fuck shit up then uh, maybe it's not i i think it's about uh, consciousness and coherence okay if we are in the context of of DAOs, uh, uh it is supposed that a DAO is actually following a purpose like a set of value a manifesto and a statement, no? That is just that, and a statement, just a set of words. Then you have the behaviors of actually the people uh, leading that. So if you have actually a troll that is conscious of all of that and is able to spot those gaps between the statement and the behaviors and their actions are driven to close that gap and make people actually to be current uh, uh, following this behavior with their value statement, there you have the benevolence. The benevol the benevol the benevol I don't know how you, t you say that. If you are not conscious and, uh, and not, and you just want people bleeding to, because that's what you feel and you don't know what's happening out there, that is risky. Mm. There is where the, the troll actually can cause harm. I mean, I think it all heavily depends on the sort of social contract that you're buying into with specific networks. Um, with Ethereum, with Bitcoin, there's a understanding that there's this informal process and that these certain general constants are held, but it is not in any way formalized. And I think that's one of the uh, sort of driving forces between those who want something that's, that's more open and transparent because we can, in some way, hard, core, hard code values mm. into the protocol Today. that Correct, like the hard code values in the protocol to the extent that we uh, put innovation first and allow for mistakes to happen and be corrected. Do you want to answer that question yourself? Do you have any opinions on it? On the question I asked? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll take a fairly extreme position here. Uh, I think we should try to break blockchains. Uh, <laughs> responsible disclosure is a process that makes sense for Microsoft Windows, but it's a process that makes sense because Microsoft doesn't know how to build a secure Windows. It's a patch, and it's not a very good patch. It just results in the power dynamics of software, which ought to empower the users at the edge, translating into the power dynamics of the underlying economics of the companies. So companies and nation states and even mid-sized terrorist groups have pretty much insurmountable advantages over a user of the software. I think we should try to build blockchains as much more resilient, and to do that, we need to battle test them. We need to make it clear that if we don't make them resilient from the design stage at the architectural level, then in the end, they aren't going to have the properties we want them to have. So maybe, like, do you think within teams, you should have some people attacking the system without telling anyone, and then yes. in the morning, yeah. yeah I mean, Internal wow. red teams, cool. excellent yeah. idea. So okay, we have a question. So speaking on the concept of morals and trying to instill you know, high values in organizations, um, a lot of people say that the DAO is kind of a solution to that, but, but why? You know, like why, why can't 500 people, let's say, become a DAO that has nefarious purposes or really like anti-humanist tendencies? Um, and, and so how can we protocolize this, like being able to affect from the edge 
large organizations that affect a lot of people, um, how, how does the lines between an organization and a human like actually become blurred where we're all a part of this? Like, yeah, how, how do you instill high values in organizations and not just let them become nefarious and be able to affect change even though you may not be the one who is responsible for the change? So that is a really good example of a question. <laughs> cool. So you, go ahead, if you guys have some answers. Is the question, how do we prevent nefarious DAOs? So, in the same way that we have nefarious organizations using existing infrastructure, people will find ways to use future infrastructure in nefarious ways. Um, to the extent that these different digital economic entities can sort of do battle and use economics against each other and have these sort of, the sort of thing Sonny was talking about, a benevolent a uh, crypto economic actor whose sole purpose is to police the network, the concept of like fishermen within Polkadot where there's value bet behind policing the network, ensuring that people aren't doing nefarious things. That can be something added. I don't know that it's uh, necessarily something that uh, we'll be able to prevent like all nefarious activity, but um, yeah. It, to the extent that these are permissionless, uh, financial, financially backed uh, uh, internet systems, people will use them for whatever they, uh, they see fit. I Governance guess can help. I would answer in two parts. Part one is that we have the DAOs compete. Most of them are going to fail or fail to uphold values. And we should use the uh, underlying plurality of resources. There can be any number of DAOs in the world subject to finite attention, but people can reallocate their attention, so they should compete. Number two is we should employ the technique of creating new status hierarchies. That sounds like a bad word, right? Like, who wants status hierarchies? But they're useful because they're different than monetary hierarchies. If you think of something like Moloch Dao, I would argue that what Moloch Dao has succeeded in creating so far is mostly a status hierarchy. Lots of people want to join Moloch Dao, they want to be part of it, they think it's a cool idea. So far, it's funded some projects, I hope it will fund more in the future and actually accomplish that too. But why, if it succeeds at the latter, it will succeed at the latter because, I argue, it succeeded at the former. It allocated status in a way that was proportional oh. to, in the end, how resources will be allocated to fund public goods. So we should try to create different status hierarchies, which are you know, anti-correlated, so they do different things well. DAOs can use, use those. Do you guys have any other thoughts? So I think you know, it, it's all about, <laughs> in the beginning, we have to set up rules. If, if we do something like a DAO, you have to set up rules and you can never be sure that like the rules that you set up will be <laughs> the best thing that can ever happen and no one can ever game that right so that's not possible so we have to be adaptive and but also we have to do all the research before setting up these rules because i feel especially in the crypto space we all feel like we're governance experts now and uh there oh my god i mean that's <laughs> that's a little true and there are all these people that have studied uh, politics and uh, governance for years and years and there are all these institutions that are uh, implementing these governance rules and i feel sometimes we don't look at this enough because this is like the old world, we don't want to be associated with it, but in reality, we could learn a lot from all these things, like vote, like anonymous voting, vote buying, all these things that will come up. I'm looking to hire political scientists at Parity. Okay, okay, no there plugs, you go. no plugs. Okay, I know that there's a question over here. So, with respect to Byzantine behavior, just to focus the question on concrete old example, what do you think about the DAO hacker? Like, is he a thief? <laughs> You said you want Byzantine behavior. What do you think about the DAO and the way the community reacted with the fork? Just give that back to him. Uh, I think that's a little bit of an opinion. Do we think that's an opinion? It's just a question? Just a, qu just a question? Yes, opinion? Okay. I'm going to go with it. I, I, oh. oh, careful. Yeah. All right, you can come up. I mean, it's, it is a question, but it's leading somewhere. Okay. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Oh. Yeah, uh, 
As, as we are creating new systems here, this system needs to be uh, um, stress tested somehow, okay? Of course, I mean, that's the, that's the way people have been, have been building informatic system the whole, the whole way. The, the difference here is right now we are building systems that actually are treating money that is there available for, for everyone. So the incentive to attack is even bigger, it's different, it's more interesting for, for, for stuff. So I think, yes, you need to, to stress that, you need to, to have people attacking your system, but at the same time you need, during, especially during the design phase and the, the, the initial develop, development phase, you need to abstract a little bit from out of reality and try to do the test by, by, by your own. But even besides, um, um, software or hacker, hackings, you actually will have a, a different kind of, of attacks. The, the civil attack, the, there is one, or I don't know, the non-reputation as, as a stake attack in which you don't care about that doubt, you just take a, an idea and you start trolling and whatever and you don't risk anything because you're, you're a pseudonym or some, stuff like that, no? We need that, yes, at what scale, I don't know. For sure, we don't need that at a scale of an organization that is handling $150 million, okay? Mm -hmm. But this is something that we need to, to, to figure out. I mean, what level of risk we want to put on the table so we can receive attack and, and the same system that could improve cool. the whole thing. I, I don't know, did that really answer your question? He, he's kind laughing, of. he's like okay. smiling. I feel okay, like okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Kind of? <laughs> okay, well, one other thing that I want to say is you can put up your hand at any time and like, if you really have your really good questions, he has the mic, I might just point at him so you'll kind of know, but we'll keep going up here, just so you know. Do you guys have any other thoughts on what he just said? Well, I think it's always an equilibrium between getting everything right in the beginning and wanting to do something and wanting to put something out there, right? And I think that DAO is probably a good example of, I mean, there, has, there had been a lot of concerns before, but everyone was also really excited because something was happening. And then to find the right balance between like, getting everything right and actually doing something, that's probably something that has to be figured out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can make a comment on yours. I want to answer myself. I want. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so just to say, I, I, I do not consider the, the, the DAO hacker a thief. I think what he did was completely legit. And I think we've learned immensely from that. Cool. Okay. There was a hand up for a while there. So, hi. Um, in a lot of talks about uh, DAO, I hear the words incentives bandied around quite a lot. Uh, which, which words? Incentive. Incentives. Right. Uh, and, but to my ears, what's conspicuously missing often is, the, is accountability. So, how do you see accountability? Uh, how, how do you hold individuals accountable in, a, in, a, in the DAO utopian, utopia? Or to put it more succinctly, uh, how does the guillotine look like in the DAO world? How does what? The guillotine. The guillotine look. Yeah. <laughs> what do we think? Question? Question. Okay. Question. Well, but you're not up here. <laughs> <laughs> What do, you guys, what do you guys think? Do you have any answers on that? I, I think we're talking about, I mean. It's, is, what's the, pun, say, do you have your mic there? No? The punishment? I, I think we're, we're coming from, from a culture in which we actually need to see guilty to punish people. But that's just an assumption, just, just an emotion, uh, an emotional need that actually can be uh, changed. I mean is if someone have an accident and uh, kill some people, maybe he didn't want to, to do, he, he was a, a mistake, he was, I don't know, having an ill or something, but the laws are designed to put that people in jail for 15 years, instead of uh, enabling him to, I don't know, be healthy and uh, no, don't drive again because you are not uh, uh, in conditions to do that, no? I come from, from a country, from Venezuela, uh, in which if you caught a, a person that is actually causing harm to the, to the community, they will lynch them. 
Ooh. They will all kill hit these guys, okay? Who will be accountable of that? No one. You are distributing the accountability there. They are, there is that kind of a behavior first? Where in that context, I will say it is. I will say it is. So maybe you don't need to punish people. Maybe you don't need to, fi to find guilty. If you find mistakes, yes, focus on correct them. But don't focus on punish people just because they did mistake or, or they did Yikes. wrong, I don't know. Or exclude people if you identify one spot, but it is distributed, I think that's not a problem, actually. So I think it's very important when you design DAOs to have some kind of an, a way for the DAO, for example, to slash voting powers for the members to get some kind of accountability. That's what you, you can think of different mechanisms to do that, but still the possibility, I think, is, is very important that the DAO will be able to slash, uh, let's say, reputation, whatever you call it, but voting power. So one interesting thing I wanted to mention is, yes, we can try to attack as a Byzantine battalion at a kind of algorithm code level, but there's also a financial component, which we don't really talk that much, which is really interesting. And talking about DAOs, we can actually build a DAO that actually pulls together resources to attack other financial components of other systems. And as we go into proof of stake, where all of their security is on chain, this is actually becoming an even bigger problem. So over time, these things actually will just keep accumulating, and we need to have very clear transparency of how much and where we have exposure and resources. So he wants to be on opinion. stage. Yeah. All right. You can give, give the mic behind you. All right. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, now there's some hands. That makes me happy. That's what I wanted to see. All right. This, this, Comment on that. Wait, he's going to do a quick comment, and then you got so it. Just a quick, so just a quick comment. There is, a, I think, very important blog post about, uh, it's called The Rise of Dark DAOs. And it gives an explanation. Do you know it? Yeah, OK. okay. So, and it gives an explanation, basically, how you can form DAOs to attack systems. And it could be completely in the hideout, and no one can know that this DAO even exists. And it's very general, and we need to know how to protect them. We need to try it. Like, we need to take the Byzantine approach and really try to form these DAOs, and we need to try to learn how to defend from them, because they will come. They will come. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'd like to go back to the question of what is a good DAO and a bad DAO. And I might, I might give, like, a, a nice analogy to this. I'm, I'm Israeli. I went to the Israeli army. And when I wore, you know, Kevlar and I went to an escalation, I, I very well knew that on the other side, like if I was born on the other side, then I would have behaved the exact opposite way. So what is good and what is bad is dependent on your perspective, basically. So that's, that's one thing. And then in the context of DAOs, um, what we need to do is, like this is, it's coming up as, as I was listening to you guys, but what we need to do is like go back to, the, to some sort of like uh, the anarchist manifesto, where we recognize what are the values that we need, and this is something that we probably need from, you know, Dao Stack and Aragon and every single Dao that is out there to come up with a manifesto of what is allowed and what are the values of this thing, of, of what Daos will be, because if this actually takes off, you know, this could be a really big game changer, and this could, be cha this could change everything and how humans organize. So. If we don't kind of set the path from the beginning to what is good and what should be ostracized, then, you know, we have a problem. Okay, we will have a problem. You just won yourself a seat. <laughs> there's, a, there's a hand up here. Uh, guy in the white shirt. Not Peter. <laughs> Not yet. By the way, when you come up, you can't, and if you get kind of booted off, you're welcome to, to come up again, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so, is voting the only thing that matters in order to make decisions? So are there other approaches that we can use in order to, like, develop uh, further the stuff, or? That's, that's a good yeah. question. Is voting the only? Yeah, is everything about voting, I mean, it's is kind voting of a, the only out the problem, do. like, I just, people vote, wash their hands, are there other approaches? I mean, there is like, I think, three types of involvement. One is signaling, where you just like, 
you don't really care, but you want to kind of voice your opinion, or that's what we do on Twitter, really. Then there's actual voting, that's you actually doing something and committing to that decision. And there's a third one actually doing. And that is where you actually go and like hard fork the code and do it or write a pull request. And that's, this is like different levels of involvement and combining them all together into like one governance system is kind of a way to build something which survives long term. So what are the three you just listed there? There's voting, signaling, signaling and, and doing it yourself. And doing, doing. <laughs> <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> To that, I would add the question, and maybe I can't ask a question, but I'll phrase you it as a question. a question. The question <laughs> of whether it is possible to separate um, the values of the DAO, but in some measurable way, from the process which is supposed to achieve them. A manifesto is wonderful. I would fully support that, but a manifesto carries no binding force. A plutocratic DAO with a manifesto can do whatever it wants. The manifesto doesn't <laughs> bind its actions. But there are ways maybe to alter the voting system to something closer to futarchy, where votes carry uh, a price, and that price is uh, you know, reflected in the end of whether or not the decision made satisfied the values. Maybe there are ways, other ways to blur that distinction or ways to encode the values into binding documents. Lots of Google's motto is don't be evil, and I don't think that manifesto worked. Didn't they get rid of it? Yeah. I heard that has gone. I, I think that uh, like futurki is one way to do that, but it has its own problems. But I don't think you should like dismiss the the manifesto because no. in a decentralized organization, the the manifesto is a very strong shelling point. It's not like in a centralized organization like Google. I'm sorry, I'm seeing someone trying to game question, this please. game. <laughs> I have no, a question. No, I want to talk no, about mergers and no, acquisitions. No, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was very that was very bad. Okay. Okay, so I have an opinion on that question about voting. And I actually think that our focus on voting in this industry is somewhat destructive because voting by definition is divisive. I have to choose a side, I'm this side or that side. And then the next system that people are starting to develop is dispute resolution. So now we're going to have disputes and divisive. Like it's not a really good start. And when you call everything that comes before voting signaling, that's all signaling, that's a tremendous oversimplification. There's discussion, there's problem definition, there's proposal making. And there's probably most of what we do as human beings we could just do without making, like, you could just do most stuff, because we agree on most stuff, but when it comes to things that we should vote on, the proposal making process and the culture by which we encourage collaboration is where the DAOs have a tremendous advantage over our current system. But we very quickly devolved into campaigning and lobbying mm. because we focused on voting. I'd love uh, for you to come up. Yeah. Do you guys have any so, thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, I, like, I like that, that you added yeah. that. I, I actually agree that the proposal writing and actually, like for me, signaling is about discovery of opinions such that you can actually figure out what is it, like what is the underlying um, not agreement, right? Disagreement between parties. Because there's always people who have very different uh, points of view as well as objectives, right? Like you can have people who have lots of tokens and they want this token to go, like price to go up. You will have users who don't want price to go up, right? That's the simplest like balance that you have. You have developers who want more users, so like they're kind of in between. So all of these parties have different kind of underlying incentive structure and this needs to be surfaced in some way. And right now, all, like from my perspective, Twitter seems like not a great way to do it. 280 characters, you know, you can put a lot of it in it, but it's not a very nuanced discussion. Proposal writing is, but you need to have people who are actually very well written as well as actually understand different points of view. And for me, like signaling is a way to at least like start this process instead of like everybody tweeting and liking and, you know, trolling each other. <laughs> so um, when I first kind of like, I don't know, delved into DAOs, my first uh, kind of way to go with this was it should be a social media. And then Steam it was something very interesting, but you know, obviously it's, it's built in a pyramid scheme, so you know, that's, that's not viable. But um, 
what if you could have a DAO where, where um, what you are aiming for is meritocracy in a certain subject or, or in a certain field, and then you have, just like in Steam, it, people write about a certain topic and they accumulate more voting power, more reputation in, 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 in a DAO, and that's how decisions are made, and then it's, it's, you get it through discussion rather than propose, get accepted, get disagreed, and stuff like that. So this is kind of where I came from, and this is what was super interesting for me in DAOs. So, <laughs> so just to echo Elon, I, I think this is a very good point that you made, and, and, because, and I think it's because this space is full of, in, or started with full of engineers. Like the, the, the voting itself, is like it's the engineering part. But before that, and if, if this was like made by, by UX people, then the social had a much bigger place. And this is the important stuff. This is the stuff that brings people together. And the voting is just the, the engineering mechanism, and this should be like the last thing. But we have too many engineers. Can you imagine reaching decisions through discussion? And like, oh, this is, we're talking in this exactly, forum exactly, or whatever exactly. it is. And then, oh, wow, we should do this. And then everyone yeah. kind of agrees already. There's yeah. already consensus but, without. But we started with the voting. Yeah. We started with the voting. You start with the ones and the zeros. Where's, where's the microphone? Actually, sorry, can you grab it again? Uh, I'm the one who chooses, just FYI. Um, hands. One, dictator, <laughs> one dictator in the room. Sorry. Uh, I want something from this side of the room. Is there any questions over here? OK, one back there. Why do you keep muting that person there? Sorry? Why do you keep muting the person there? Muting the Censorship. person here. Censorship. The one that is very eager to ask the question. Or oh, oh. Well, because he just broke the system and there are punishments and rewards <laughs> in systems and those must be... He Stole didn't the get my approval. He just grabbed the mic from somebody else. I don't like that. He tried your approach, the Byzantine approach. <laughs> OK, hands. You. Uh, yeah, I have a very general question. Uh, let's say you guys are building a, a DAO, and you, you, want to, you want a group of people to work on the the sign of uh, governance. My question is, who would you hire to design governance? Would it be people to, with a back what? Sorry? If you want to hire a group of people to design governance, who would you hire? Someone with a background in political science, uh, I don't know, mathematics, economics. And the other part of the question is, do, do you think it's important for this group of people to really uh, be technical, like to understand about blockchain or to be coders? Um, so I, I can tell you that, uh, just an example, we, we ran a, a decentralized hackathon, like the first pilot. It was, uh, I, I do like a decentralized hackathon in East Berlin, uh, but shameless self-promotion later. Um, and we ran a hackathon that was meant to do, it was about 70% people who were artists. None of them knew what blockchain is, and it was so easy to make them understand everything. Like they didn't get into the MetaMask and what is the private key and all these things, and it was fairly easy to kind of like make them understand that this is a platform where you make decisions together. Um, so to your question, if you need people who are proficient or understand what blockchains are, I don't think so. And, sorry? I would hire people who played World of Warcraft. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, I, I played World of Warcraft and this is, I spoke about being in the army. This is the best thing that helped me move people and, and, and you know, be a, co a good commander in the army, playing World of Warcraft, so. <laughs> no, uh, uh, yeah. So. So, I don't know why we have a majority of Israelis on the stage right now. <laughs> Probably because we just love to argue and disagree with each other. Um, I don't think the military paradigm is particularly helpful in this world. 
and I have two children who serve, so it's not, you know. But it, 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 when I look at how, like you, you asked a general question, but one of the things I've learned in this industry is it's not a general question. And I interviewed about 10 or 12 different DAOs about their governance system, and it really depends on what you're governing. The right governance system depends what are we making decisions about. Are we making decisions about how to invest funds? Most of the DAOs today are about discretionary funds. If you have a bunch of like fund money, discretionary funds, first come, first served with a decent enough proposal, that's great governance. But for most of the important decisions in government, that's not important. So I think that when you're creating a DAO, all these experiments are incredibly useful. Like, I don't think they've been incredibly successful. They've been fairly decent. Like, they've done okay. And that's good for a first iteration. And I think when you create a DAO, that's how you should do it. The people who participate in the DAO should be using this, iterating it, figuring it out, and you probably need a little of both. Um, I think game theory is incredibly important. I think interface is probably even more important right now because people can't use these things. And I also think that, um, again, it, it, it depends. Like, people talked about having opinion and signaling. Do we want raw signaling, or do we want people to educate themselves up to a certain level before they express an opinion? And again, it depends what you're governing. So we need to think very carefully, like, who's in the DAO, and then have those people part of that self-healing and self-creation of what the DAO is. Uh, question is, uh, so if I'm focusing on the on-chain governance, the, uh, the, how to say, staking money makes sense, because if it's on-chain, you can control how money goes. If money is not a stake in the governance, why do we need it on-chain? It can be just off-chain, yeah? That's a really so good why question. would you need on-chain governance if money is not the if, primary factor? If it's because not you about can't enforce technology. anything. That's yeah. a really good question. So if I got your question right, so I, yeah, if, if it's if it's not if there's nothing, there's no action, okay, then putting it on-chain is costly. And but but I just want to emphasize that it's not just money, right? You can have. ENS records, you can have, there's other things that you can, the more we get, the more we build on top of Ethereum, then we have more things we can govern. So it's, it's not just money, but I agree with you. It's if, if it's just signaling with no execution, then you're right. So there's a question all the way over there, but do you want to answer first? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, like, I'm not proponing as on-chain, but the reason for on-chain in general is availability. Like, not everybody is able to participate in off-chain governance, especially when off-chain governance is just like us meeting in some room. Like, that's definitely not always taking everybody's opinion. Or Google Forms. Well, well, except website can be hacked and opinions can be changed and, yeah. I, you don't need blockchain, but you can have some cryptographic, you know, maybe security on it, and you may want some identity layer, and then we're kind of building up some blockchain functionality. You guys can put your hands up at any time, by the way. So I just wanted to bring it back to talking about kind of the off-chain consensus making oh. coordination layer. Because um, it's, it's like we're dealing in a whole new age of like massive scale, um, like cross the world coordination, and we're using existing services like Telegram or Discord or whatever we use to be able to manage very important things. We're talking about whole organizations, like people's livelihoods. And so I think that we need to fund social applications because like to a much higher extent and really innovate there before we get to this point where we're using DAOs for all the things that really like, you know, matter to us in a day-to-day -day life. Yes. Okay. That's you got opinion. this seat. I think you're off. <laughs> and yes. Yes. That's a yes. Okay. I think the guy, the guy next to you, right there, that's who I thought was asking the question. Sorry. That's cool. You got the seat. Go ahead. Oh, okay. It's a really simple question, I think. Like, I heard a lot of statements um, the few days, except when we talk about DAOs, like governance and companies is broken, 
companies aren't agile or governance in nation states is broken, and then the then stuff comes. But I'm interested in the why, it's because I believe a problem well stated is a problem almost solved, and I'm not sure if we all see the same problem. So I'm interested in the biggest problems, just to. So I think you can take that seat too. Yeah, can you say, say the question again, but then you voiced some sort of opinion there. What was the, what was the actual question? Yeah, the question is, um, what, why, are, why is governance broken, or why okay. is governance in the classical sense not agile? Governments or governance? Uh, go governance. 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 Okay, pass him the mic. And... So I think that uh, we may have gone too far to say like all corporate governance is broken and all you know governments are broken. Um, I think corporate governance isn't broken. Corporations were designed to make profit and concentrate profit and they've done a damn good job. They've had some things that they call externalities like, I don't know, air, like that's in my lungs but somehow it's called an externality. I, I find that quite confusing. But, but I think corporate governance does work for the purpose it was set out to, which has become more antisocial. But I think that the governance that we see is broken is the governance of our countries, and I haven't had anybody actually say they don't think that of any country. Um, I... and, and, and it's stagnated. It's just, it's not even evil anymore. It's like you can't actually even get anything done. And I think that's just um, symptomatic of old systems that don't evolve because it's not like whether you're a democracy or not, like all the governments aren't working and there's just this, like it's like they can take a decision and it never gets executed. They can have, you know, AML is a perfect example. It's been in place 20 years. I don't think any of us have seen a reduction in money laundering. It's just everything is completely frozen and we see the evidence. And I think it's just old systems that don't renew themselves. Um, I don't think there's any malicious intent at all. And you, you just need to sometimes refresh things. It, it, I, I, Sounds I wanna... a bit like... Yeah, what, what you said about like corporations, it, it was kind of very obvious that in the 80s it was maximize shareholder profit. This is, this is, that was their manifesto, basically. And I'm coming back again to this, where we, the guys here, the people here are, who are into DAOs, who are into um, decentralized autonomous organizations that uh, once we set them off are just going to work, um, we need to be responsible right now and, you know, overlook the differences between the different systems and come up with something like this. Come up with a manifesto with, I don't know, Ten Commandments, whatever, however you want to call it. Um, but this needs to be done as soon as possible because, you know, once the cat is out of the bag, then. I, I also wanted to add that we've been talking about the distinction between like privately held companies and then also state uh, level governments and um, thinking that the state level governments are the ones that we should affect change on because those are the ones that we need to represent our, our, our actual needs uh, with. But like that doesn't help the people that are dependent upon their uh, employer for their health care, for instance, or for their re re retirement fund. And so I think that like just focusing on governments doesn't fix the um, privately held companies not having our best interest in mind. And I think that we need to find a good uh, middle ground between the two and kind of show the world that yes, there can be a hybrid that exists and that can, can help you um, and, and operate efficiently the same way we've seen corporations operate, um, but can also hold your interest in mind. Although it does sound like it might only be on the short term. Like eventually these systems seem to stagnate anyways. Yeah. Sorry to be negative. Uh, so we mentioned a few times today the human component of autonomous organizations. My question is, how can we scale constructive distributed human interactions? That's a good question. Wait, can you repeat? How do you scale? How do you scale what? Constructive human interactions, but of course they will be distributed in this way. So I can't say I've got a complete answer to that, but I think we know that it's quite possible to very rapidly engineer human behavior, and say Facebook's done a good job of that, right? So we've changed our behaviors radically due to the interactions that are incentivized and not with money, right? So I think in the same way we can start to look at how would we create a system that incentivizes, for example, collaboration? 
And if you just think, I'm just gonna talk about that one tiny aspect, because obviously this is a very broad thing. So right now we have systems that are winner take all. If you get the proposal, you get all the funds. But what if we said, okay, there's a certain amount of funds for putting the best proposal on the table, but anybody who participates in the discussion in any way gets something. And if the two of you have a similar idea and you decide to collaborate instead of compete, we're gonna give you a bonus for that. And even if your proposal wasn't chosen in the end, the discussion and the, comp you know, the collaboration contributed to the best proposal. And I think that we can engineer systems like that I think it is just as much human nature to want to collaborate as to want to compete. Like, we want both. And I think we, it really is a systems problem. And if we put our minds to it and we start adjusting those incentives and moving the needle and what do you get incentivized for and how does the community deal with dispute, you know, making it really acceptable to have a, a, a different opinion like we have done here. Like there's no command, you know, these kind of incentive programs where, okay, move on, next person's turn. There's a lot of ways to engineer that. Um, All right. Can, can I say something to this sure, as well? Sure, sure, um, sure. So, so I think, um, so two parts, like one is just, just a general hint. I think like when you say systems, like cybernetics and system theory is really interesting looking into this stuff. And if you say how to um, do it, how to scale meaningful human interaction to, to, to a larger scale, I think, so I'm really interested in like recursiveness and self-similarity in the recursive system, right? So finding a structure and having the structure work in and of itself, like because this makes it easier and then having a coherent information flows and, and, and accountability streams, right? And um, yeah, I think bottom up, Top down, I think both, both, both at the same time. I've never heard recursive used in that context. I only notice like recursive snarks. <laughs> totally different topic. Uh, if we succeed beyond our wildest dreams in creating better forms of collaboration, and they gain access to and control over more and more resources, they will inevitably come into conflict with the nation state. How should we plan and design now to ensure that maybe conflict is the wrong word, but that, that combination or that uh, renegotiation of the structure of power goes well? That's a really good question. Yeah, so I, I think that nation states are, are I, don't, I don't know, I, I may Obsolete. be very ignorant, like having lived in the US, but, but I do think that the people do have a way of like shifting change, maybe not rapidly, but in some reasonable fashion. Like we've seen a radical change in the past like four years and it was in a direction that doesn't quite make sense. But anyway, um, what I wanna say is that as we give people this new reality of saying, hey, the company you work for, you now own part of and you can actually invoke change in. Your insurance company, it's a peer-to-peer -peer insurance company and you're helping verify claims and you're getting paid for that. Like all of these different systems that we now hook people up to, the organizations that they are typically dealing with change, their understanding of what a system that, that they're dependent upon changes, and they start to like realize that, hey, government's broken, what the fuck? So, I don't know, yeah. Um, I think we shouldn't be naive about that. Governments will use force. And we are all dependent on electricity and the network, and we can be shut off in a moment and we don't have our own water, and we don't have our own food. So I think um, there are very few people, I think Holochain's the only people in the, in the industry talking about we've gotta have our own nodes, we've gotta have our own network, we've gotta have our own connectivity, we've gotta have our own water, and we've gotta have our own food. It is inevitable. I think we need to be very strategic. I live in Slovenia, although I'm Israeli. We need to be strategic about where we live where we make these communities, embracing the rural communities that are being crushed by the current system, and they do have the means of food, and we're probably gonna go through some periods of time in some geographies that are gonna be very difficult on us, and we should not be naive about what we are taking on. Um, so, I would frame that governance is about collaboration to solve game theory problems. And, but I feel that only works when the people in the game have similar values. What, what do we do when we approach 
situations where people have fundamentally different values. Like, what if two groups of people have different like beliefs about what property rights are? Or what if two groups of people, like the Bitcoiners and Bitcoin, or ca Bitcoin cashers realize, oh wait, we were working on different projects, we don't have the same vision here. And does that, what, what do we do in that case? Do we use violence? Do we use, what, what does that look in the new age? I, I think you answered the question and it's, you fork. The, the DAO will fork. And you actually, you're gonna, he's gonna take your spot right now too. Come you take can... my spot. <laughs> Are you gonna bring your hat? Oh, nice. Yay! <laughs> But yeah, like, what, what, what um, do we, what, like, not even in the blockchain case, what if it's not a blockchain? It's like human societies, like, what do we do? Yeah, so I think, like, like I think the statement is really, really good to think about. Like, I, I believe that it's, I, I think it's, it's safer to assume that there isn't a universal value set we all can agree on, but there's probably a plurality of value sets and maybe some are in, incompatible in a sense. But um, I think maybe, maybe we can do it like in the global trade and kind of sense why maybe war is bad because everything is so interconnected. So if you think about value sets and DAOs and having many value sets, maybe like let's say we are really opposed value sets, right? But, but you are closer to me. So we have one, um, we agree on some things and you agree with her on something and you agree with him on something. So we are maybe directly opposed to each other, but we share this connection in some way. So it's really not good for me to be adversarial towards to you and I'm still in some sense at least second order interested in that you don't really completely lose right so therefore we create an indirect vested interest doesn't that sound kind of fragile like that sounds like the concert of Europe that fell apart in 1914 yeah I'm not saying it's perfect solution <laughs> <laughs> all right I think we have a question uh, so I want a slight pivot but Sonny's on the stage now so I think this will be good I want to kind of take it a little bit back to the gentleman from near protocols uh, discussion around these sort of malicious DAOs, but let's not call it malicious DAOs. Let's say, like, imagine a future of Pac-Man chains where uh, smart, uh, go smart governed chains can uh, merge and acquire other networks. What does that future look like? That's a good question. There's a question. Pac-Man chains <laughs> coined right here. <laughs> and I'm glad you followed the rules this time. Thank you. Here, you want to grab this guy? I think I, I thought I was the only person old enough in this room to have played Pac-Man. I know Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that there is an, I mean, I think that's just how natural systems are going to work. Like natural systems merge and separate and, and we're all going to belong to multiple systems. So I think it'll be a little bit indistinguishable. Like the edges of the DAOs will be indistinguishable. Um, just like the edges of our community are indistinguishable, so. Yeah, and I think that like the main thing that changes here in this dynamic is that we now have more of a choice, um, hopefully. Uh, if like money and network effect doesn't reign supreme, um, like we have a choice to be able to break the mold if it starts going in a weird direction and like the, the merger of these systems starts to form into this like amalgamation that we don't recognize anymore. We now have the choice of breaking the mold and maybe still remaining compliant with shared protocols, but there's now a bridge for others to, you know, join this new network that is shaped in the way that they like. So yeah. The other thing I have to say on that is that we've got this, um, one of the problems that we have in current society, and I think we need to think about a little deeper, is that uh, in particular in the United States, they have this issue that like corporations get rights as a being. Mm. Like those are not things they don't bleed. If the corporation loses all the money, it doesn't die and get buried. Like we have to be really I think we need to be a little more precise, like these DAOs and sub-DAOs and nests or whatever you call them, they're not real. They're not real. When you cut them, they don't bleed. And I think we need to think more in terms of like one person, one vote and different reputation systems and not like a DAO, one DAO, one vote. It starts to get really, really messy yeah. when we start to think that entities are real, like a country is real, like it really doesn't bleed when you cut it up. So we have one, so guys, it's, it's hot in here. We're gonna do, maybe we do like, what do you think? Three more questions, five more questions, or do you guys wanna keep going? What are you thinking? What's the feeling here? You guys, you're, gonna, you're in for it? 
Yeah? Okay. So we have a, we have a question right here. Yeah. Um, we have different type of uh, decision making. So we can decide to like buy in a, uh, for a company. We can decide to buy in for a uh, change, or we can decide to buy in for a uh, feature in a specific uh, uh, app. Um, can, can we, you, or them, create like a framework that asks the right question in the right time? So the right uh, question, and then ask for voting in the right time. So um, essentially, can the system, uh, can we create a framework that asks, uh, uh, do you want a faster commuter rather than you want a faster horse? Do you want a faster commute? Commute, like a better rather car. Rather than like, a faster like I'm, horse. Like I'm actually picking from Ford. Like, mm. they, they, they said, like, if people were asking me uh, what do they want, uh, they wanted a faster car. So if uh, we make a system where you have, like, decision-making based on a very, very segmented, fragmented level, then you can ask for a faster horse. So how do we make a framework that categorize all of them? I think that's a question. Yeah, I, yeah? I, I was careful in yeah, that. Yeah, you were careful. <laughs> I, I really like what Colony did in this case, was they basically said that you can make any decision, make any action, and it goes through execution um, without any voting unless someone sees a discrepancy in it. And then they basically make a dispute and then voting happens. And so it's, it's kind of like permissionless by default. And so I think that that's kind of getting towards this idea of we want something to happen faster. Um, but then, you know, being able to slow it down if you need to. So I think that there's like a middle ground that can be reached with these governance systems to give the best of both worlds. I think, again, artificial intelligence is making a lot of really, is making decisions for us. And I think that you can, again, look at Facebook at very intelligent feeds. Now, they're intelligent in that they're doing their job, they're not doing a better job for humanity. But I think that uh, there's so much data collected about us, where we're going, what we're interested in, what affects us, what doesn't affect us, and I think we can create really great AI systems that will bring to us the issues that we should be involved in, that'll say, listen, there's something, a discussion going on about this thing, it affects you, and not many people from your demographic are talking about it, and we need your opinion on it, or we need your vote on it. And so we can create those systems. Um, and, it, you know, one of the evolutions of AIs that we talk about is that they'll make decisions for us, and people don't like that idea, but nobody ever, like when you first got a GPS, it would show you a few options to choose from, but you don't choose anymore. Nobody would ever question their GPS anymore. And we're going to see more and more of that. So we're going to see many of these decisions being made by signaling of one way or the other. The question is, how well do we program those systems that are programming us to optimize for our happiness instead of for us to buy more shit we don't need? I, I wanted to add to that, that like AI choosing for me scares me. Because like, you know. It's scary. Yeah, for sure. And like, I, AI is great, and I want it to plan like roads for us. I want it to plan for us, but I want us to choose, you know. But that's just me personally. Like I don't, I don't want it to choose for me. But maybe you can opt in. <laughs> Who I choose? You have a question. <laughs> you had a question. Do you still have a question? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll try to tie it into this conversation you're having right now. But um, I wanted to backtrack a little bit to your statement earlier about like we don't want to have corporations with rights over humans, but like what I've seen is that if we label things as this is a human, this is a corporation, like one of the, the benefits of incorporation is it protects people. And I wanted to ask like whether you think it's better if we move in the direction of everybody can incorporate whenever they want to, or if it's better to move in the direction of um, no, nobody can do that. Like, and, there, there are no corporations. And maybe even put that in the context of DAOs or something. Like, where? Y yeah. Like, do you, like, do you get, do you get protected by a DAO? Yeah. Can you get protected by a DAO? Can you get protected by an AI? That's for example? Super. Is it the protection? Like, yeah. Exactly. That, that's what it was. Created. Corporations were. Uh, they, they protect people f mostly from financial liability. Um, I have, like, I could say many opinions on this, but the most extreme opinion would be the Israeli opinion on this. Um, you can't say I was just taking orders. Do you have, do you have any thoughts on that, Sonny? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree that we should be making things more accessible and even the playing field. I think that, like, in, in legal systems, we have, like, two major costs, which is the cost of compliance and the cost of discovery. And the cost of discovery is how difficult it is to learn about the rules and actually uh, engage with them. And then the cost of compliance is how hard it is actually to follow them. And I think that currently in the system, legal system, cost of dis we use costs of discovery when we want to benefit certain people over others, people who have access to capital to like do that to like be able to research it or access to more time or access to special connections and favors and so we should be you know okay. in legal systems we should have like rules and that have cost of compliance but we should be trying to reduce the law the costs of discovery yeah and so i think sorry the cost of incorporation and like following all the rules to incorporate properly is a cost of discovery but back to the dow kind of idea like if you put that in the context of DAOs. yeah happens? so so like for instance like plug like i work for a DAO that's incorporated and it's beautiful because i get to work for it get paid by it and i don't have to worry about getting sued personally and so like the beauty that i see in the future is that anyone on their phone can me and you like we want to start a restaurant we create a corporation on our phone. We, we basically put up our idea and we look for funding, like initial funding. We find like a lease. Like being able to enable innovation and enable people to have like this dynamism of doing what they want to do in life uh, because the barrier to entry is so low. I think there's a question over here. Um, I have a question on how to run the check and balance on um, um, the working, whether the, fun the DAO is functioning. Uh, especially, I want to point to, someone mentioned about um, the tyranny of the structurelessness. And uh, as we all uh, discussed earlier, a lot of our decision makings were influenced. Um, and uh, the participation can be limited to uh, very few um, in uh, leading to certain results. So. And a lot of times what we try to, um, to resolve for that is through uh, better framing of the questions and to direct to a certain interpretation. However, uh, and also there's also surveillance or kind of like trying to capture what are the um, invisible powers. But then in doing so, um, what is the fine line between how much to govern who is governing. And the privacy aspect versus surveillance state, yeah, that's, I know it's a really convoluted I question. I think you, you have an opinion, yeah. but if you want to answer, okay, <laughs> okay you, you grab it then, cool. Oh, uh, can you give the mic back to the guy behind you? That was very good. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? That's a huge yeah, I mean, question. The, yeah, there, there, there was a lot to this now question, right? Now solve all of the problems, solve, no, panelists. I, I, I can't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, the, the tyranny of the structure is really like, um, it's, it's, it's in, in the end, it's, so, so, so what comes to my mind is just one point. It's in the end, it's about the, or why de some people claim democracy is failing, right? And this is because you can say, like, Cambridge Analytica, like, I can influence you without you knowing influencing, right? And this is especially a vulnerable, vulnerableness in an unspecific, unspecified, I'm sorry, unspecified system. Unspecified way? Thank or you very much. Yeah, unspecified yeah, system? Yeah, structuralist system. Then, structuralist system. So there, there are two things. Like, so first, it's, it's good to specify structure, but it still can be attacked, like, if you have perfect knowledge of the system. And it boils down to um, requisite variety or Ashby's law. Like, um, if you want the governing structure that tries to govern a system or influence a system, the higher the amount of states it can muster, the more responses is it can adapt to. So in the end, it comes down to the most complex system will always, or has, has a better chance, not will always, has a better probabilistic chance to get the outcome the system seeks to get, right? So. This is just the problem, the line of problem you have to think about, like how you can create 
um, higher degrees of um, variety? How can you position yourself in a system with a requisite amount of variety to cope with the, like you stated, with the, you have to think about, you have to, and it's, it's not an ordered system, I, it's not even a complex system, it's a chaotic system. In all of these systems, there are different strategies. Ordered system, it's doing structure, it's doing the same thing over again. Complex system is the strategist. And in, in, in chaotic systems, you have to just wait and see and react and be prepared for lots of things, have the variety to adapt. And it's like steering a ship through thick fog and you're not knowing where it is. And so you can't predict where you should go. Maybe you can make some elaborate assumptions, but what you can maybe do is like make your ship better to adapt to as many possible situations as possible. So, okay. Even though there's some hands up and I would love to keep going. We have been here I think for an hour and 15 minutes which is the longest park bench panel I've done. This has been really cool. What's your proposal? Better. Uh, going to that Okay. Why shouldn't all of us open it up? That's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat back in the mic what you just said, if that's okay. I know you just got a mic, but I'm going to say it because I want to conclude. You will so say I, it better. I want to go back. What he just said was basically that first question I hinted at asking was like, how can we use DAOs to make a lot of this stuff better? And I think that this conversation has been fantastic. Thank you all. I want to give us all a big hand for coming up here and being brave and speaking your mind, and this is very cool. And I want to also say thank you so much for bearing with us all through this heat, because it's hot. I know a lot of us want to get outside. I can't wait. But by the way, just because we're getting off the stage doesn't mean you have to stop talking. You've now seen all of our faces. Come say hi, keep, keep this conversation going. So thank you all so much for coming to the governance game.